All right, here we go. Make do Suburban Fireman Podcast, episode 35. I'm your host, Nick Peppard. My uh, co-host, Sean Duffy, is a little bit under the weather today, so we are Seanless on this episode. But uh, we are honored to have our good buddy, Devin Craig, on the show with us. Devin, welcome to the show, man. Hello. So, uh, yeah, man, we'll dive right in as we normally do. Uh, normally start out with a little bit of background of where you started in the fire service, kind of to what led you to where you're at now, and we'll kind of jump off from there, man. So, uh, give us the give us the goods. So, my uh, my father was a volunteer fireman. Uh, he started that when I was four, and uh, fun little deal. Uh, I'm an only child, so it was me, mom, and dad. And uh, dad would do the fireman thing so he would go you know one day a week he would go to a uh, training class for the night and and my mom started going to night school so i would go there at night sit under the kitchen table and this is back in in 88 so they would pass the hat for this little volunteer fire department to to put fuel in the trucks you know and stuff like that and and i remember a guy telling me i got to wash under the stripe on the side of the truck you know and this thing and and I grew up around those guys. Uh, that fire department is now very big. It has nine stations and it's fully paid. Um, but I grew up in that. And so my my older brothers were firemen. And it was the big family that I had. So when I uh, graduated high school, it was the way to go. Um, and that led me to a, a fire department very close to where I, I grew up next door. Uh, I started there and that was 20 years ago. So the fire department I started at originally had three guys every day out of one station. Um, and we ran about 2,000 calls, wasn't too bad. And now there's five stations with 27 dudes every day. So we, we grew up just as much as everybody else did. Um, this part of Texas grew rapidly in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, and it's been great. It's been a good place to work. So uh, that's me. So that and, you know, the typical part time fire jobs here and there or top fire academy or whatever would take me and led me to sit right here, I guess. Hell yeah, man. Uh, you know, it's it's always cool to see first generation firemen, you know, jumping in or second generation, third generation. I mean, it, it's it's a legacy that whether you're starting as a fireman, you know, and getting people in the family involved with it or, uh, you know, having people that pass that down to you. So uh you know on, on both ends of the spectrum i think it's just cool when you when you have family intertwined with it because that's what it is right it's the fire yeah. department is a family and when it comes down to it you know i'm first generation but then my brother got involved so you know by default my wife my kids my parents have kind of uh over the last 18 years that i've been on the job have kind of got into the fire service like whether they liked it or not they kind of got involved um and so you know it's kind of cool to to see uh, my little guy now he's six years old and he's like, man, I want to be a firefighter when I grow up. And that to me, like, that's cool. You know, yeah. I love yeah. that. I love, you know, you talk about your dad and you talk about kind of growing up around the fire service and then, you know, having that a part of your life and it just kind of becomes who you are, right? It becomes a little bit of part of your identity because that's what you, you know, are immersed in from a young age. And so, you know, I can hope, I mean, I, I would like to think that maybe one of my kids goes down that path, but you know, I'm not going to push them if they want to do it when they get older, then, uh, fully supported obviously i think it's the best job in the world but uh it is cool to see you know guys kind of carry that torch from generation to generation like i said and then right. the people that start out it's cool to see how that works out sometimes where guys are you know like i said uh the first generation but they kind of light a fire and other relatives cousins brothers sisters uh right. and it, you know you got that weird uncle that's a firefighter it's like oh yeah my uncle so-and-so is a firefighter and you become a firefighter you know so uh definitely a pretty cool thing um so that being said, you're in Texas. Uh, give us geographically what part of Texas are you in? So this is always comical because growing up here, you don't realize how big it is. And it's massive. It's huge. Um, it's huge. <laughs> it's huge. So uh, I live just north of Houston. Um, if you were to to draw a map, so you go straight north to Dallas and then at an angle down to Austin, San Antonio, and then back to Houston. The majority of Texans live in that triangle. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm on that bottom corner right north of, Tech, of Houston. I'm about 85, 90 miles from the coast. So it's the hot and humid part. Um, and, yeah, we have summer 13 months out of the year. So, yeah, I'm down here. Yeah, yeah. You are You are currently uh, I'll probably so – here's, here's hell, and, and here's where Houston, Texas is, like right on the edge of that. So I'm pretty sure you guys probably actually have – pay homage like at some point like taxes to the devil I'm, i don't know how that works down there well, but here's the deal though our we have bunker gear for the summer 
It has shorts. So we wear bunker shorts. There you go. See? Innovators. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you don't you don't need feet, okay? <laughs> you don't need feet to fight fire, okay? Just get used to it. <laughs> uh so yes, very hot and humid. Uh not very unlike the place that I spent a good portion of my career, uh in northwest Florida. Very similar latitude and area and hot and humid, very similar uh, climate. Um but uh it keeps you honest, right? <laughs> it makes you it makes you earn that uh, that paycheck for sure. Well, you, you don't even have to run anything major, right? You just go to a few vehicle accidents, a couple fire alarms, you know. Oh yeah, and, no. And you've, you sweat through three or four or five uniforms a day, easy. It, yeah, no. Most of us are sweating at six a.m. and we're used to changing two or three shirts a day. Oh yeah. And again, oh, yeah. you know, you we, in March, April, when the, when it started to get warm, we try to stay out as much outside as much as we can to acclimate to acclimate. it. And, Yep. And then the, the deal now, and this is people are going to freak out about this. My my house stays at eighty degrees. Um, that wasn't a decision made by me. My wife liked it that way. And then at night, it's only seventy six in here. So it, the fire station, you know, runs at sixty five degrees. So when it's sixty five and you walk outside and it's one hundred five, you're you know your body's in shock. For us, we kind of get used to it better. So sure, sure, yeah. No, I don't know. I uh, even in Florida, I, I try to keep it a. 74 to 75 was like our, our window. I'm a little bit, uh, I, I, I have an overactive sweater. Okay. I, I'm one of those guys that if it's like above 75, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm sweating. So like where I'm at now in Wisconsin, it works out perfectly because most of the year it's, it's below 75. So uh, <laughs> no below 70, I'm wearing a hoodie facts. I've seen it <laughs> <laughs> in person. So, uh, yeah, man. So let's talk about your department profile a little bit. As far as you said, what do you got? 20, 27 a day. Is that what you guys are at now? Hey, we run 27 uh, a day. That's uh, five stations with six companies. Uh, my house is a double house uh, and we run uh, everything. So we, we make EMS runs, but we don't transport. So we don't have any ambulances. Okay. It's, it's good. It's, an, it's a good, good mix with that. Hmm. Uh, we're running about 65, 70% EMS and then, uh, fires and, and car wrecks and grass fires and whatnot, automatic alarms, um, rapidly growing though. So we, we probably only had 20,000 residents, uh, 15 years ago. We're probably looking at about 50,000 now. It seems like, oh, wow. um, I know literally right now from my station, I can see three or four neighborhoods popping up. So, and, and we're seeing a big trend for us and most of the country, it seems like where we were having these big acre tracks or five acre tracks with one house and two people living in it. And now that's 20 houses with four or five people living in each one. So, yeah. uh, we're getting busier, uh, good department to work for. I love it. Um, uh, very young, obviously, um, and not many people that are, are very old whatsoever. Uh, and and big, big push on fire, big push on being aggressive, uh, and taking care of yourself. So, um, we got rules, but not a ton of rules. So as long as you're doing the right thing, they're good with you and, and we can train all day if we want. It's, it's a good place to work. So, yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah. Um, so what is your typical, like if you guys get a you know, structure fire, you get a box alarm, what's your typical box look like going to a fire? So we have a school territory. So even though we, so we cover 233 square miles, um, but a, a good portion of that is an, is a national forest. Um, and there's pocket houses in that. And at the same time we have full blown neighborhoods, track home neighborhoods. So, you know, there's no, there's one fence for two houses kind of thing. Um, if from my station, if we go left, it's fully hydrated. Um, and we take a 105 foot ladder truck. If we go right, we take a 3000 gallon tanker, um, same crew swaps that. Um, and all the pumpers are a thousand gallons. So it's, they're, they're big trucks. Um, a typical box will get, uh, for a hydrogen, we'll get four pumpers, two ladders and a chief, um, a non-hydrogen will get, uh, two pumpers, four tankers and a chief, about the same amount of people. Um, we have mutual aid agreements with uh, everyone around us. Um, and the two, a couple of our neighbors are full-time fire departments like us. Uh, we have two neighbors that are all volunteer. They come from the house. So if we go that way, we're not getting a whole lot of help, but still, you're still looking at a good 20 guys on scene. Um, that's the change, uh, 10, 12 years ago, um, when I started there, even 20 years ago, it was three guys and you were going to get three fire trucks with nine guys total. And most of us worked for those other departments on the side. So it wasn't uncommon to make a fire at four or five o'clock in the morning. And the mutual aid fire you just went to, we well, are working there tomorrow and you're swapping with your guy on scene. So it was, it was really fun back then. Now, a lot of guys it's it's you know it's not as much work 
it seems like and we got a bunch of people that want to do stuff uh but yeah it's it's we're growing to having a lot of people and getting used to that we're not we're still not used to it at all um but we're trying so sure what uh so you you're a captain there is that correct I am. I've been a captain there since 2007. Um, our structure is fireman, lieutenant, captain, battalion chief. Uh, okay. So I'm, I'm, and sadly, I've been a captain, whatever that is, 16 years. So I'm the senior of the three of us. So there's one captain at the main station along with the chief. Uh, the captain rides the ladder truck or the tanker, depending on what kind of call it is. And then we have a small, we call them boosters, um, it's a little grass truck that we take if there's a really long response. We get a couple of houses that are 35 minutes away buried in the National Forest. We'll take it up there. So. I got you. Is it, uh, so So the outlying houses would have your lieutenants in? Um, yeah, so my station has a lieutenant on the pumper, uh, and then the outlying ones all have a lieutenant. And the outlying ones run in between two or three total to five total. Uh, one of the outlyings uh, is actually in a really cool deal. So that station is on the edge of our territory. What they did was they made uh, the neighboring department put a, an apparatus in it with three guys. We put an apparatus in it with three guys, and then there's also an ambulance that's an outside company there. So you have three companies all together from completely different departments um, that all work very well together. Um, and the deal is it's on the edge of our territory. It's on the edge of their territory. So they're able to, to mutual aid essentially in-house. Um, and then we have a station that uh, was a four-man company, and they just got a boat. We, we, we border a lake, um, and they moved it to a five-man company. Now they have three guys on a pumper and two guys on a squad. Um, that actually started Monday. So oh, the other nice. two stations have four guys. Uh, and I have great lieutenants that, that work their butt off and take care of things. And it's not uncommon for me to talk to them maybe once or twice in a 48 hour period, which is mostly everybody. Good. Good. No worries. So cool. Yeah. No, yeah. it sounds like you guys, uh, got it working out for you. Um, yeah. you know, it's, it is, it is kind of unique to have multiple agencies in one station. So that's kind of, that's kind of cool that you guys are able to work that out and kind of, you know, like I said, mutual aid in house and kind of, <laughs> Hey, you help us, we help you kind of thing. And, uh, it, it was an like experiment it. that worked. So, <laughs> Hey, sometimes that's, uh, yeah. Some of those are the best I ideas are just, Hey, let's try this and see what happens. And yeah, so cool. Cool. So, uh, yeah, I want to dive into uh, a little bit on the, uh, train or die thing, man. So obviously, uh, a lot of folks know you from train or die. Uh, it's been a pretty successful social media presence as far as the training world goes and getting things out there, sharing ideas. And uh, I just want to you know, pick your brain a little bit. Uh, what got you going with that? And, uh, you know, now it seems like it's kind of bounced around multiple states. I think I don't know how many states you guys are in uh, having people putting stuff out, but it uh, seems like it's taken off like wildfire, man, and, and uh, seems to be uh, a pretty good center point if you will for for sharing information uh and and motivating each other so uh, let's just talk about that for a few minutes man what got you going on that down that road and and uh from where it started where it is now and anything you see on the horizon uh with trainer trainer die so we had a we had a bunch of guys that worked at a fire academy together um and and very high motivated guys uh there's four of us. Um, three of us are captains at their departments, and another guy is a driver at his. Uh, all been in about the same amount of time. Um, three of us have kids, and all and those three guys that have kids both have a boy and a girl. So as weird as that is, and unique. Um, and we noticed from the fire academy stuff that we saw, and the stuff that we were pushing forward, and the stuff that we we were starting to do things that made more sense. So uh, things that just blanket rules we never liked you know if you go in a burn building you have to crawl but do you you know and, and things like that and then we started to realize that we knew a bunch of stuff that everybody else didn't really like they knew it but or they hadn't heard of it and it was we started to to kind of hang out with some other folks that were the same way as our mindset of us and then uh and then covid happened and it kind of it's it stifled our ability to work at the fire academy um so we kind of all got together and said hey we want to try this thing uh, and, and it progressed to what it is now. So we teach some hands-on classes. Um, we've been, a, uh, a couple places in the state of Texas. We've been to Oklahoma, uh, several times. Um, and then, uh, we, there was a, a few lectures that we do. Um, and then we write a lot of stuff and 
the the ability to write things on social media um, to to one as a mental health get it out for ourselves um, because anybody's in a fire service long enough knows that things are going to wear on you um, so the ability to get it out and then have other people respond that are feeling the same way or think the same way or holy cow turn to that and one of the big enlightening moments for me is is I live a half a mile from one of my department stations. Uh, and I'm gone a lot. So when I'm gone, uh, the D shift or whatever is taking care of my family. And if they can't get to the second floor of my house and climb in the window and pull my kids out, my kids are going to die. And that's, <laughs> that's as scary as it sounds. And that's the truth every day in the fire service. And we've, and even as much as, and we talk about fires all day, but things like for us, we do CPR calls and we'll do an, an IGEL. So it's a basic innovation thing. If we didn't want to do that training or didn't pay attention because we're an old EMT, that person dies. And, and this kind of reflected what we were doing. And we noticed that there is, there is some standards in the fire service that aren't very high. Uh, and it's really easy in this job to hide. Uh, and, and funny enough, the recliner ends up being the place most people hide. And, uh, we, you know, we did some stuff with, uh, we have a sticker and a t-shirt that's got a recliner on fire on it. Uh, and people bought it and we were amazed, you know, and, and, and we didn't realize that there were so many people that had the same mindset that we did that we don't, we don't mean that you have to do a 24 hour shift and wear your gear for 23 hours and bench press a thousand pounds. No, but you, you need to put the work in to, to do something for the community and, the four of us don't really believe in rest days. We don't really believe in things like it's a Sunday, so we're not going to do anything or, Hey, I was busy on my days off landscaping. So I need to take a break or, and we noticed that that mindset is if we push that, that, Hey, if you, if you work out every day, whatever workout you want to do, I don't care. Something. I don't care if you walk, do something, especially for us. Like just walking outside in the heat is a good idea. Uh, and then you trained on something, you learned something today. And then you took care of whatever the, you know, the fire truck is clean because somebody's paying for that thing. Then cool, man, chill. But if you didn't do that work, then what you owe somebody. So it's, it's cool because that mindset has worked out. Even my own shift. Um, we had some guys ask about something uh, and it was the night before Thanksgiving. And I said, Hey man, we can try this tomorrow, but tomorrow's Thanksgiving. And, and that's up to y'all. It's a big holiday. And their response was, no, let's do it. We're not going to eat till the afternoon anyway. Let's do it. So at 10 o'clock in the morning, we're throwing ladders on Thanksgiving. And they're happy, you know. So, uh, And we've kind of tried to push that mindset around that there's people that want to do stuff. And they don't like these excuses that people are given. So let's go do it. And that, that really became what we've been doing now. And it's it's been comical. We I can't keep hats in stock. I can't keep t-shirts in stock because, again, we're not a... Right, Amazon or Walmart, you know, we buy what we can buy and we have the money for it. Um, and I, we didn't, we didn't expect to sell anything. We didn't expect to go anywhere. We just thought we'd write a rant about don't be a jerk at work. And holy crap, a million people liked it. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, it's, uh, I, I dig it, man. So where did you guys uh, come up with the train or die thing? I mean, we're, we're I, I know that's kind of, the, you know, the play is essentially like, hey, you got to do, you got to do your job. You got to put in the work so that people don't die. But obviously, uh, so the logo itself, though, it came from a little throwback to the revolution, right? Like a little yeah. little bit of piece we, of uh, the American Revolution. There's no doubt we stole this from somebody. Um, but I don't I don't think Benjamin Franklin's going to call me and complain about no, it. No, um, no, I, I dig it, though. It's uh, it, it's a, it's really catchy, man, because. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then it was it was real simple um, and a little direct, which is kind of how we are. So we we yeah. liked that very simple thing of, hey, man. Yeah. You do you. I'm gonna do me, and this is it. So, no, I, I think it's kind of it's kind of cool a little play on our history as a, as a nation, but also just that you know that that uh, that that spirit of kind of pushing back, right? That's what yeah. um, you know the colonists yeah. did. Right? They pushed back. They said, "Hey, you know, we're not gonna take status quo, and we're not gonna be pushed around and told that you know we can't live our lives and to the fullest and be free and you know." And so, kind of the same thing in the fire service, right? There's a lot of people yeah. that uh, get beat down and wore down from people that want to put out their fire and stuff. And it's cool to see a little counter counter culture, if you will, a little pushback to that. Like, Hey, you know what? No, we are going to work out. We are going to train. We are going to be in, into the job. And if you don't like it tough. 
Yeah, and in the end, I really, I really don't care. And the cool thing is, if you complain about it, you're not complaining about it while you're standing next to me when it's 100 degrees outside. So, okay, <laughs> well, I, was, I can't I hear you say, from the recliner. I don't care. I was gonna say nobody's as the people that are gonna be complaining are usually not the ones that are getting wet and putting in the work in the gear. So, you don't exactly. have to worry about it up there. Exactly. But uh, yeah, man. So I, yeah, trainer, trainer die has has taken off, man. You guys have definitely got a huge uh, social media presence, a huge. Uh, following uh, as far as people sharing ideas i love you know a lot of the stuff that gets thrown out on the page on facebook man is always always solid stuff it seems like uh people are always putting stuff out there to kind of make the fire service better and push her push ourselves and hold you know hold us accountable right that's what it should be we're holding our our peers our, ourselves uh the people that we work with and you know both directly and indirectly because ultimately like i said you know for, for example i live in a place where I don't work. I, I, I work 45 minutes away. And guess what? I still w- would hope the people that are coming to my call in my house, you know, are, yeah. are training that are putting in the work and trying to be good firemen. So it doesn't really matter, you know, whether you work where you live or not or live where you work, I guess whichever way you want to look at it. Um, but, you know, the, the expectation is still there for your family. And I think that's what people need to remember is that your, your family you know, is, is important to you, right? Well, their family is important to them. You should want the very best for your family, no matter where you live, no matter where you're at. And, and I get it. There's, there's financial constraints. If you live in the middle of nowhere, I, you know, there's, there's obviously financial constraints, but that's not an excuse for the firefighters that are in that department to be lackluster, to not put in the work. And, and people sometimes use that as an excuse. Well, I'm a, we're a small department and they use that as an excuse not to be excellent, not to be pushing for to be better or not to be training harder and i look at it from the opposite perspective if you're in a small department that's underfunded that is understaffed right that has less people to do the same amount of stuff that needs to get done i.e put the fire out search for victims ventilate all this stuff you got to be better you have to be even better because you don't have the numbers to throw a fire nobody else is coming so and and the citizen gets whoever is going to show up so if you're in a small department, it's worse because no one's going to fix the problems that you make. So you're yeah. it. And, and you know, however many people are going to die in house fires this year is going to happen. And that's, that's terrible. But that's, that's just the house fires. That's not counting the car wrecks or the, the CPRs or anything else. And, and you got to be good on your game. And a lot of people just think that be sitting in a chair counts as experience and that they, they know stuff because they know stuff. Um, the other three guys are great. Because it's very much a, uh, a I learn from you, you learn from me, um, and I want to know what you know, and I want I want to teach you everything I know. And there's no I'm better than you, none of that nonsense. Um, you notice you rarely really see our names. Um, we do that on purpose. Um, we don't really want you to really care who we are. Um, and it, it it took me a long time to even do the first podcast because I didn't want anybody to know it was me, you know. And you'll see a lot of a lot of we because. It doesn't matter the person. It matters the idea, and it matters the, the overall goal. So, if, if we can if we can raise the fire service, or raise the local, or raise the little fire department that we go to just a little bit, then we're helping, and that's what we're going to do. So, yeah, one hundred percent, one hundred percent, man, and and I love that. I love the the team drive and mindset um, because we rise or fall. This is a team sport. We rise or fall based not just on our own actions, but on the actions of those around us. And if we're not trying to raise the bar of everybody around us and we're, we're selfish, like we're, you know, we're yep. one man, if you're trying to be a one man show uh, it's only going to take you so far because if everybody else around you is not getting better, you're not leading, you're not making the fire service better. You're not making your fire department better. And ultimately you're going to fail. Yeah. Um, and I, and I will say this, you know, I love that you talk about the idea, not the person. And, and there's so much truth to that. Because at the end of the day, we should be focused on what is right, not who is right. And, right. and that's what happens in a lot of places is egos come into play and people start worried about personalities over performance. Yeah, if you're giving an emotional response to something, then you're, you're messing up. So you should, you should be calm in what you're talking about. You should be easy, ke- even keeled. And, and if you feel your blood pressure going up because somebody said they want to load a minute man instead of a triple A, hold up, dude. Let's, let's look at the data behind it. And now it's, it's 2023. I can pull any data you can imagine off the internet in moments and tell you, this is the best way to do this. And it doesn't matter that it's linked to Boston or LA or who gives a crap. It doesn't matter. It's the best. That's the best right. way. And and we like to say too, we like for the better ways and not the best ways because the better way means we're going to keep trying to get better with it. Best is a stopping point. I don't like that idea. 
I just want to get better. So yeah, we should always be challenging ourselves and in, in our way of thinking, you know, and I think like, you know, striving to be incrementally better. Oh, and sometimes yeah. that means having a hard look and saying, Hey, you know, let's, it's been a few years since we looked at this hose load or this, this technique for forcing doors or whatever, like there's stuff that comes along and some of it's good. Some of it's not, it's, you know, applicable or whatever. But the point is you're constantly trying and refining and it's that, that's, you know, process of, you know, do the work, evaluate it. You come back and say, okay, did that work as well as it could have? What can we do to be better? And you go back to the, the lab, so to speak, and you go, okay, let's try this, try, try that, you know, and, you know, and then put it back out there and see, okay, hey, that worked really, really good. That really didn't work that great. Okay, let's tweak it a little bit more. And, and that's every fire department. If you want to grow and be healthy and have a great culture, that's the way you, I feel like you can't get stuck in the mud. You mm-hmm. can't be like, this is the way we've always done it and we're not changing. Because if you do that, th- there's so much stuff that will get, you know, next thing you know, you're you're 30 years behind uh, on tools and techniques. And you're crawling around h- hanging on someone's boot in a circle looking at the ground, you know, because some book told you 30 years ago, that's how you search. Yeah. Or, you're, or you're, you know, forcing <laughs> doors with tools that you have no idea how to use because, you know, nobody's taking the time to move past the real basics of, of just like, hey, you know, you think every halogen is the same. You think every nozzle is the same. You think, you know what I'm saying? It, because you yeah. just don't do the work. And yeah. and the thing is, like, what I'm saying, you know, my thing is get your hands on stuff. Be a student of the job. Constantly be learning. I get it. Like, look, we got stuff on our trucks that's 20 years old that we would love to have replaced. And, and most of the guys are like, yeah, we'd love to have it replaced. But they're like, hey, it's not in the budget, whatever. And guess what? You make do with what you have but at least people are being you know trying to get educated and figure out hey you know there's different hooks out there there's different tools that are maybe a better for this application and, and and that's the thing is like if you're not looking at the little nuances and trying to figure out how you can be better you're never going to get better you're never going to get better if you don't ever do the legwork to evaluate yourself whether it's tools techniques operations whatever and and makes you know make decisions that are based on your organization that's the other too i see the, a problem where guys try to mimic the you know the big departments that they idolize and stuff and i'm like you know and that's okay to an extent you know you're learning still but you have to make the tactics and tools fit your houses your apartments your staffing right it's all well and good you know if you want to have all this this gizmos and gadgets you know people i do have a lot of people talk about like hose loads and uh nozzles and stuff we do a lot of engine classes and it's like they want to you know fdny runs uh you know the fdny spec 188 inch three quarter hose and yeah. and on it they have a one inch slug tip and that's great if you don't mind 90 pounds of nozzle reaction and 210 yeah. you know gallons of water coming out of inch three quarter uh, and you have the staffing to throw at and then, and then they want to use it and they're like oh this doesn't really work great because we have two guys on hand line and i'm like right. you know you got to go back and say hey, what what fits your organization and, and whether it's a hose load whether it's a tool whatever the case may be it doesn't make sense just to mimic just because somebody else does it. Like you have to actually use it in your buildings with your staffing, go back, evaluate what works best for you. And that's, that's what I tell people all the time. So people ask like the question like, Oh, what's the best hose load? Well, I have my preferences, but, yeah. but where I work is different than where, where you work. And it may be different where somebody else works. You know, if your typical setback is over a hundred feet away, cause you're out in the rural setting and houses are way back. Like I would not recommend a pre-connected 200 foot, uh, you know, flat load for you. I might say, Hey, maybe, you know, maybe look at some sort of courtyard type stretch. If you're always extending hose line beyond 200 feet, does it make sense to have a 200 foot cross lay or 150 foot right. cross lay? Uh, right. If you're if you're a department that has your typical cookie cutter subdivisions, and that's 90 percent of what you do is 60 to 70, 80 foot setbacks. The triple layer may work great for you, but if you put it in my city where I have 20 foot setbacks on most of our houses, it's it may not be the best load right for that that yeah. situation. And I think that's where people get hung up on you know, all this stuff. And, 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 you know, really what it comes down to is you have to be a student of the game, go out there and put in the reps with the staffing and the people that you have with your apparatus, with, you know, your district and figure out what is the absolute best case scenario, or like you said, better scenario uh, for you, always striving to be better, always striving to figure out those little things that can make you, you know, more impactful with, you know, that should be the goal, right? To be more impactful with less movements. It's not wasting movements, not doing something just because someone says you should do it, like figure it out and and make it work for your scenario to the best of your ability. So that when you get on scene, 
it's like clockwork, man. Like you, you've got your truck set up, you got your equipment set up. Your guys are performing based on your tactics, uh, you know, that you need to implement to make it work for you. Cause like I said, you talked about going left and right, you know, one way is hydrant and one way is no hydrant. It's like, are, those are two different operations, right? Oh yeah. Doing water 100%. supply in, in, in a, in a suburban setting where you have hydrants in, in a rural setting where you don't have hydrants is a different animal altogether. So hydrants are easy. You just hook to it. That's yeah. it. I mean, <laughs> Jesus. Sorry, I got on my on my soapbox there. <laughs> I, uh, you know, it, I, I don't know, man. Like I said, people just, I think really what it comes down to is do the legwork, do the work, you know, do, there's no shortcut to success. I, you know, Fields says it all the time. You know, the, <laughs> there is no shortcut to success. You know, the, what the shortcut is work. That is the yeah. only thing that's going to get you there is putting in the work uh, day in and day out consistently. Now, uh, I'm going to get on this more, the soapbox more in a little bit because I have a segment that I think oh uh, fits you perfectly. But uh, before we jump into that, I do want to talk about uh, a class that you do, Lazy to Leader. And I, I first of all, I love I love the name and I love the concept of what you do with it. Uh, a couple of years ago, you did it down in North Florida for us. Uh, really good feedback from the students that were in the class. But I want to talk to you about, um, you know, where where the class came from, uh, why you're so passionate about the topic, uh, and and kind of what led you down the road to like, hey, I'm you know putting this class together and it's something I want to share with people. Um, you know, walk me through what uh, kind of lit a fire under you to, to put that together and, and some of the feedback, you know, I, I know you've taught it a few times now um, that's, that's led to, you know, that point and where, where people have given you feedback and, and do you feel like that message is resonating in your neck of the woods, of the fire service, but also across the board uh, you know, I've seen stuff on, on the Facebook page, like we talked about earlier, it seems like people really had a lot of positive feedback on there, but, but I'm just curious, uh, you know, like I said, when you, when you start looking at like, Hey, I need to put a class together on this and I want to teach on this topic. What, what led to that point in your career or your mind where you felt like this is a message that needed to be told? So I, I became a captain at 23. Uh, and I was raised in a fire service where you show up and did your job. It was good. And I remember my first day of work as an 18 year old kid. Uh, nobody was under 30. They were like, a, they looked like they're a thousand years old, you know. And I, I worked with some guys that, that worked at my department on the side, um, and they were Houston guys. So these are grizzled bastards, and you know, they fought fire with Hades and no gear and that kind of stuff. And 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 they were they were really good dudes. And you learned that this is you do what they say. Um, you didn't ask questions. And okay. And then when I became a captain, I thought that's how it worked. You just tell people to do stuff, and they just do it excitedly like i was and i found really quickly that wasn't the truth and that i had to, to change my mindset on it and then I, you start to notice that when i would go outside because i was getting ready for the smoke diver program uh when i would get ready for that people would be asking what are you doing and why are you working out what are you doing this and and it was it, it somebody told me one time it's it's easier to feed the animals than it is to chase them so saying, hey, look, man, I'm going to go outside and, and do a gear drill. Can you time me? Turns into now, it's not just me by myself. It's me and somebody else. Um, and progress from that. Uh, and then taking a little time to, you know, you make a little response and you maybe do a wash down on the road. And that wash down turns into why are we using the red line? Or why would we do this? And, when I, and be able to learn from it. And we started to notice that the more you got people outside and the more that you got people doing things, the better they were. It's, and it's just some of its reps, some of its, their mindset changes a little bit. And then when I started getting these questions of, hey, man, my crew sucks. What do I do? Well, this is what we did. Or, hey, uh, the officer doesn't want to train. What do we do? Okay, well, we do this. And then the, realize that the little lessons that we learned that we thought, or I thought that everybody knew, they didn't. So maybe we'll put it in a, you know, in a package and, and see if somebody else can learn something. Um, and that's progressed to where I've taught it uh, in four, maybe four states now, I think. Um, and at the same time, we'll get everybody from the kids to we'll get the old guys and being able to give some lessons because experience isn't the best teacher. If, if I have to experience everything, then I have to make every mistake. And, and over the long term, that's not going to work. Um, but if someone else gets to see me mess up and learn from my mistake, then okay. And then we don't make that. Um, and it works out a whole lot better. Uh, so the class goes over most of ways that, that we were able to get people engaged and, and I was able to get people engaged and things we did. Um, and again, there's, 
there's no yelling involved. There's no, you do this because my helmet color is different than yours or any of that nonsense. Cause in a long term, it doesn't work. And, and I found, and it took me a good 10 years to figure this one out, that the guys that worked the best were the guys that care for each other. So simple concept. We have a drive through uh, bay um, with two companies. Well, if the pumper makes EMS runs, well, their bay door in the back sometimes is shut. So just for those four guys to get up at three o'clock in the morning and go to a run and come back and be able to drive to the bay because somebody on the other truck opened the door for them um, just helps their life out a little bit better. And, and little things like that go a long way. Uh, and, and that covers that in that class. And, and a lot of the officer stuff, um, I'm sure some of the same stuff you're, you're doing too with your class where, Hey, look, care about these guys, do work with them. Trust is one of the most important things and paying attention to your people. You know, does your jokes are not joking today is, is, is the guy that's always there an hour early, five minutes early today and things like that. Um, go over a bunch of stuff. There's at least 2000 books every year put out on leadership. Um, so a lot of it's repeated stuff. Uh, but we, I sure I try to apply most of the stuff I learned personally and, and the other guys that I work with at trainer die can tell you the same thing. That's stuff that they've used. Uh, and it's, it's cool to go somewhere and something that we, you know, think is so simple and everybody knows this. I, the guy's never heard that. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, no, this works. So, yeah. So, it's it's been good. It's been good. I've enjoyed it. So Yeah, man. I, I love the, uh, you know, the focus on the personal aspect of it and just taking care of your people, you know. And, 100%. Uh, it's easy, you know, and guilty uh, being a new officer, young um and trying to lead people that are older than you or or you know maybe been on the job longer than you um or just been alive in general or around life in in, in general longer than you uh that is hard sometimes it's hard to walk into and i think if anything you know that i can vouch for is is uh just because you got the bugles on your shirt doesn't mean that respect immediately comes with that and oh, no. and i love the fact you know just put in the work put in the work uh, to get to know your people putting in the work to care, uh, to go the extra mile to take care of them, uh, putting in the extra work to train them to, you know, and the thing is sometimes that doesn't make you the most popular guy when you're out there like, Hey guys, you know, we need to do this. I know it's hot, but like we gotta, you know, we, we need to go over this stuff. And especially at first, right. At first until they kind of buy in and people start seeing like, Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a lot easier once the buy-in happens and people start to kind of get on board, like, okay, this is, you know, yeah, we want to do this because we want to be better. We want to be, you know, we want to hold each other accountable. We want to have, you know, input into the process and feel like we're, there's ownership there. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, just taking care of people and that's where it starts, right? That's, uh, it, it's really hard to, you know, to, to command respect if, if you don't have their hearts first, you know, if you don't kind of win them over as a person and, and, you know, yeah, people will follow, you know, orders because of your rank because they have to, but true buy-in and true respect comes when there's that personal connection there and and they respect you as a person not just as the captain or the lieutenant or you know whatever your rank is above them um that's that's where real buy-in happens and that's where real change happens was when they do it because they want to do it not because they have to do it exactly exactly and it's 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 hard work and it's it takes a lot and it takes a lot of paying attention and a lot of hey look you you don't get to be better than anybody else and and and, you know and, and granted i I do a bunch of stuff uh, in an office that they don't do um, while they're doing other stuff. But at the same time, um, if I've worked my butt off on a Sunday and came up with a training plan for the next six months and those guys know that, hey, look, on July 3rd, uh, we had training scheduled with three stations and we're going to lay a thousand feet of hose. And on July 3rd, we wake up and it's 110 degrees. Hey, fellas, we're going to do this a different day. Oh, OK, cool. And they they get that. and. And that little bit of buy-in, a little bit of, you know, nobody, nobody's the monarch of this thing. And we're going to do a little bit of democratic stuff and, and understand that, hey, look, this is how it is. And OK. And you get that buy-in with people. And and the, the biggest thing I've noticed, especially being older and, and getting further and further uh, out with stuff and learning more and more stuff is I have to still be able to say, I don't know. You know, I, I have no idea what that is. You know, I. I had a guy in a class uh, that I was just hanging out in his class and he asked me a question about ticks. And I looked at him and said, I have no idea, but uh, I've heard of this dude, Andy Starnes. Let's ask him, you know, and, and Andy, God bless him. I, I hadn't met him at that point. Uh, and I sent him a Facebook message. He responded with an answer and my, he wanted my email and sent me like three videos. 
Jesus. <laughs> you know, and he easily could have told me, yeah, yeah here's uh, come to my class. And, and that open dialogue that we have now in 2023 really means that nobody should not know stuff or not want to know stuff or not be able to reach out and get it. And there should be no, we're doing this because that's how we're doing this. No, if the data says it's different, let's try this. So Yeah, yeah you don't have yeah. to have all the answers just because you're a lieutenant, captain, <laughs> chief, whatever. Uh, I think it really is a sign of maturity when you can, and, and humility when you can say, hey, I don't know, but let's go find the answer. I think that's the important second follow-up part to it is like, I don't know the answer, but as, as a leader, you absolutely have to follow that up with, hey, let's go find the answer together. Like let's, you know, or I'll go find the answer for you. I'll bring you an answer, you know, next shift or whatever. Um, you have to have some follow-up. I think that's where, you know, uh, people gain a lot of respect when you do the legwork to get the answer. You know, even yeah. if you don't know it, you're humble enough to say, I don't know, but you're also dedicated enough to them and to their cause and what they're bringing up to go get the answer for them. And uh, that's the the second half of the coin, so to speak, uh, where a lot of people fall short, like, oh, I don't know, or they, they they make something up that's complete BS. And nowadays with technology, with these things, man, like, dude, it's people will tool, find... It's a tool, man. It's yeah. a tool. The whole but, world is in that thing. There's a video for oh, everything yeah. now. They will, they will know if you're full of shit real quick, though. Oh, yeah. In like five minutes, if you're full of shit with one yeah. of these bad boys. <laughs> yeah. No, I taught Fire Academy for seven years, and you better watch out. They're going. They're going to check you on breaks. Oh yeah, yeah. They're going to absolutely get in a fact check going there. Um, so this next segment I want to do, uh, it's called discipline, dedication, and drive. And this is a segment that when I when we looked on the calendar, said Devin Craig's coming on the show in a few months, uh, and we set this up. I was like, man, we got to talk about this because, uh, you know, kind of watched you. You know, I've known you for a few years now. We've we've you know, obviously done stuff side by side a little bit, you know, running to each other at different trainings and things like that, different conferences. Um, I've always, you know, felt like, you know, you have, have really uh, impressed upon me. Like you're just, just the commitment, man, the, the hustle, the hard work. And it's not no frills. It's not flashy. It's just, you just put in the work, you know, and every time I see you, you're, you're, you know, taking classes, you're taking notes, um, you're, you're hustling, trying to get better, working out, whatever the case may be. And uh, you know, so when, when, I knew you were coming down the show, man. Like this is something that like popped in my head. I was like, we're going to do a segment on discipline, dedication, and drive. And I want to get you, you know, you're a Georgia smoke diver, correct? Yes. Still, still officially <laughs> blessed. Uh, okay. So, uh, you know, that takes a lot of all three of those things to be successful in that program, right? I mean, smoke divers is no, oh, yeah. is no joke. It's a lot of preparation. So uh, let's walk through, first of all, um, you know, your process of becoming a smoke diver because it wasn't easy, right? It was, it took, a lot of tenacity. No, it's, it's, it's a, it it's done. a long road. It's a long road. And, and I, I, it, it's one of the most, it was the best class I ever took by far. And, and it actually focuses, you wouldn't think it, um, but it focuses very big on humility. Um, and you wouldn't think that from the amount of, if you've ever met one, you know, immediately, cause there's probably, he's probably wearing a hat or a shirt or tattoo, or he's got something um, that shows you how much it means to us. But they tell you at the end, uh, Chief Rhodes says flat out, congratulations, you're not better than anybody. So you still got to work, and now you're held to a higher standard, so you got to do that. Um, I, I internally think I'm the laziest person on the planet uh, and, and feel like if I'm not doing something, then I'm being a piece of shit. Flat out. So, like, and I, I, I have a hard time sitting still. You've seen how many I move in this, this 43 minutes. I, I haven't hardly sat still yet. Uh, so if I didn't work out today, oh, dang it, you know, I'm just mad about it. And then tomorrow I'll do something. And then something as much as, is, hey, look, today I got to lift. It was good. Fine. Uh, tomorrow I didn't really have time. So we'll go do, I'll make it harder the next day. Um, and try and do a little bit every day. And knowing that uh, it, it all counts in the end. Um, smoke diver was a struggle for me. For, and I am probably the worst example of one. Um, except because it took me four times and two of those times I quit on my own accord. Uh, and, and it was my heart wasn't in it or I wasn't ready for it. Or I, I remember the very first time I went very well and that I left on the first day cause Holy shit, these dudes are serious. Uh, and it was, it was a thousand miles from home. So, uh, the, there's proof in the fire service that anybody can be one of those guys. Um, we, there's guys, uh, I know a, a little dude named Casper in Georgia who's like, he's like a damn midget, for Christ's sake. He's like five foot two. 
Uh, and then there's monsters that make it through it too. Um, it doesn't matter what they're built like. It matters what's going inside inside their head. Uh, and it gives you that advantage of, hey, look, I, I know what I can do. Uh, and, and when people ask, hey, why did you do it? Well, because you won't. So I, I know what it means. And I know what a hard day looks like. And I know that making a two alarm fire and going through two bottles ain't a big deal no more. This is not the worst. Uh, the, the class is, is based on very realistic things. Um, and it's very big on servant leadership. So they, they explain it to you. They demonstrate it. You practice it. Then you do it in live heat or, or fire. Uh, and it's as real as it gets. Um, and you're talking 80 to 100 instructors that don't get paid to come there. So the program is outstanding. Um, I, I really, it'll hold a dear to my heart for, for sure. Uh, and, and we like to call it the black hoodie cult because it's the softest hoodie you ever wear. And you, you, when you see a guy, you'll see it with some guys were giving me hell at FDIC because every time somebody walked by with a number or a, a rocker on, I was, I was their best buddy. And it was, it was like an old friend. Um, and, and it's good to get that in the fire service. Um, most of my discipline and dedication stuff comes from my fa my father, um, who I'm still not really sure what time he goes to bed. It's probably somewhere between one and 2 AM and he gets up probably around three or 4 AM. Uh, and I don't, I don't know how he does it. Um, and he has always had three, four or five jobs. It feels like, uh, and, and kept going. And, uh, I never forget my, my, my dad, when I was a kid, we went to a fire station out of town on a vacation and he walked up and said, Hey, we're from Texas. Can we see your fire truck? And next thing you know, my dad's picking up stuff from these guys in Utah that we could use back at home. And, and it was that humility to know that he'd been in the fire service for 20 years at that point, but he didn't care. Um, he wanted to learn something new because something better was out there. So, and then my, my dad was still is, he probably still does it today, but if, uh, when he lived in a neighborhood that had a uh, trash service, if he saw the trash truck, he'd walk out there with a water bottle and hand it to the guys, you know, and then that ability to, Hey, if you can help help. Um, and we all going to get through this together. So I, I have this little angel on one side that wants to take a nap all damn day and, and just wants to go to bed, um, which is what I do if I sit down too long. And then on the other side, I have this little devil's like, well, you're lazy. So, let's go do some shit. Uh, and then I'll just go do dumb stuff. Cause it makes me feel better about it. Uh, I, I do a lot of outside workouts cause it's worse. Um, and life just sucks. So, <laughs> uh, so it, again, I don't, I, I feel like we need more of that in the fire service. I think we need more people that need to understand that. Hey, look, I don't care if your fire department makes 10,000 runs or 10, uh, somebody is going to need you to come help them. And, uh, Justin phrase gave me a good term the other day and I'm probably gonna write something about it called, uh, uh, an Olympic fire department. So do you make one fire every four years? And if you do, that better be the best fire you ever make. Uh, and you better work your, your nuts off to do it. Um, and, and just because you don't make a lot doesn't mean you're not going to make anything. So you have to put that work in and that work is harder in that deal. If you're, if you don't make a ton of fires, you got to figure out some way to get some reps that are realistic and, and get some, some hands on stuff and, and get it down because you can't be making this crap up or because you, you watched a YouTube video on it today. It means you're going to be good at it. So it's just pushing yeah. forward all the time. Always. Yeah. Yeah. Always incrementally. What's that? That's saying 1% better every day, man. Like exactly. Just, if, exactly. You, think, you think about it. If everybody got a little bit better, even just marginally better, Every yeah. single day, you compound that over 10, 15 yeah. years, 20 years. I mean, how much better could we all be if that was the mindset, right? Um, yeah. I want to circle back to something. Um, so you said smoke divers took you four times to get through it uh, successfully. It's um, a six-day class. It took me uh, 14. So <laughs> let me ask you this. Uh, this you know, what... Uh, what was your motivation? What kept you going back? You know, a lot of guys would have said, Hey, you know, second, third time you didn't get it. Um, what, what kept you going back? What made you, what, what was the drive behind, you know, Hey, I'm going to do this a fourth time. Um, after being unsuccessful a few times, I mean, what is, what's going through your mind after that third time, especially, uh, you know, if you had, sounds like the third time, maybe there was medical, something that happened that, that pushed you out or, was that so uh, the, the first time I didn't prepare for it, I, I had an idea what it was. Uh, okay. 
drove over there and was there for like six hours uh and then was like wow this sucks uh <laughs> and i came back and my, my wife was like what are you doing home already i'm like well this thing's back uh and it was a 12-hour drive one way yeah. um and then they're good about uh holding the hook out there and i was getting emails every time there was a new class so the first time i went was in 2012 mm -hmm. um and i went back again in 2017 so it took me five years to go back um and when i went back i took i took about maybe six months to get ready for it and i went in january of 17 uh and i wasn't at that point, I've been the fire service for 17 years. I've worn a Scott Air Pack forever, so I, I didn't really focus on on my breathing because I was used to it. Um, and there's an evolution they do on the fourth day that uh, that you use a lot of air, and I wasn't prepared for it, uh, and I didn't know any techniques to get better at it, and I, I failed out in that evolution. And when I failed, it was 9 o'clock at night on day four, and to be honest with you, I was relieved. I was tired. Yeah. Uh, and then I drove home, and that was that was January. Um, and then I went to Indiana in October, um, and had some mental stuff where my, uh, my daughter, um, didn't want to talk to me when I left. Uh, she was little, I think she was uh, a little, a two and a half at that time. She didn't understand that I left. Um, and we had tried, uh, to do some, some, uh, you know, FaceTime stuff and she wouldn't talk to me. She wanted me to come home. And, uh, and then one morning I uh, you know, that's, that's, that's probably enough for me. I just want to go home. Um, and I was doing okay. Uh, and whatnot. And I came home and, uh, I came home and, and, uh, Georgia was two weeks later and a couple of days before Georgia, uh, my wife sat me down and said, look, every time you do this now, you're, you're training for six, eight months. And if you don't come back with the number, you're, you're depressed and you're, you're not fun to be around. And, so now you're looking at you've, you've trained for almost a year for this. And, and what have you got out of it other than being depressed for another six months to the next classes? So she told me, she said, you need to go back and get a number and get through this. And I, uh, I trudged through that class, uh, and was by no means, uh, stellar at anything. Uh, you're required to eat five to 6,000 calories a day. Uh, that's the only thing I was good at. Uh, I could kill food, which um, has a lasting impression on me five years, six years later, I'm still killing food when I want to. Um, but it was, and it, it it's kind of where, so at that point we'd already put it above the front door. Um, and it says always forward, always moving. And, and what that, what I did there was where I really learned that. So every time I would, would like when we would get back at the hotel, I would set my clothes up for the next day. Um, and I'd set things out in order. And then when we would get to the field, I would set my gear out and, and I would tell myself, man, I don't want to put this gear on. It's cold. It's wet. It's November in, in the mountains of Georgia. This sucks. And I would say, well, the next thing is put your gear on. So just put your gear on. And I put my gear on and go, well, now you're wearing your gear. So you got to stay, you know, and Hey, look, well, there's, there's an obstacle course. Okay. There's, you know, however many stations of it. Okay. Well, I did one. I also did the second one. And it came to this thing of, of, uh, always forward, always moving. And then uh, someone told me a thing. It was, uh, there's two rules, of, uh, three rules of motivation. Uh, step one is go forward. Step two is repeat. Step three is if you forget step two, look back at step one. So keep going forward and shit just goes. So, yeah, yeah I would recommend doing it four times. That was a terrible <laughs> idea. Uh, I would also not recommend doing it at 33. Um, but no, it was, it was definitely worth it. Uh, the, yeah. the group I got in because of it, the people I've met because of it have been fantastic. Um, the things I learned at the class have been fantastic. Uh, and it's been really, really good to me. Um, I've gone back three or four times. I wish I could go back more, but, uh, with kids in my schedule now, it's hard. Um, yeah. there's a program in Oklahoma that I've been able to make an appearance at, uh, every one of their classes, but it's, it's been rough. Um, I encourage it for everybody because it's a learning experience for yourself and, and even getting in the shape to be able to go is a big deal. Um, it makes you better. So, well, and that's, you know, I think that speaks to, you know, we talk about dedication, you know, that, that's dedication, right. To keep going back and, you know, the drive to, to get back up and do it again. And to, you know, one more time, one more rep, one more, you know, and, and it's, uh, you know, people get, uh, hung up on, you know, motivation. Um, but I want to talk about the, you know, discipline 
versus motivation for a minute because I think the motivation is fledging, right? It's it's one of those things that it it comes and goes. Some days you're motivated, some days you're not. Um, but discipline is really where the you know where the consistency comes in, right? That's where the real gains happen. Uh, and so, have you found in your training, your personal training over your career with smoke divers and other things that you do? Um, you know, people hit these plateaus sometimes, and it gets you know they get in a rut, they get bored, they get uh, they get unmotivated, and then the next thing you know, they they fall off the the wheel or you know the wagon. Um, but but I want your thoughts on this because a lot of people you talk to will tell you that the the biggest growth usually happens during those plateaus or, or those valleys, even those times where you're just struggling to get a workout and struggling to to read another chapter start you know struggling to to you know put one more rep in pulling holes forcing the door putting your gear on um is that has, is that something you have found to be true with your with your own personal uh training and habits and things like that where you know sometimes the biggest growth happens through that adversity through those times of like i just don't want to do this and you do it anyway uh i i know for me like i feel like those moments are really kind of what set apart the people who you know get really good at something or or get you know rise above the adversity and and achieve you know greater accomplishments than people that that don't and and it's not that they're superhuman it's that they just find a way to keep doing it and keep going and keep putting in the time uh you know you, you talk to anybody that's been around this job long enough and it seems to be the common theme is like if you want to be successful um you have to you know have to be disciplined it's just it's consistency it's not burning bright for a short period of time right it's it's that that slow burn over 20 25 30 35 years yeah. of putting in a little bit extra every day and then when you do fall off the bandwagon not letting one day become two days become three days become four days of recognizing like hey i failed today i need to get out there tomorrow and make it up yeah a good a good look at it is say you want to deadlift 400 pounds you're not going to walk in there and deadlift 400 pounds you're going to deadlift 135 and then three months from now you're going to deadlift 225 and this is going to be a long struggle over a long time and to get to that goal and it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to be easy and it's not going to move by itself. So, uh, I had a, I had a pretty good little run. The last time I went smoked ever were, were, uh, three or four days I was getting ready for it and I didn't want to do anything. I was tired. I was worn out, you know, whatever, you know, I, I'm still the guy that if I get a hangnail today, man, it might put me out, you know? So I got to keep, get over it. So, so I wrote down a workout, uh, on a piece of paper, uh, with a permanent marker and I threw the marker away and that was the workout today because you couldn't erase it. I couldn't do what I did, you know, and I, I'd, I'd done enough of, Hey, I'm going to do five rounds and wow, we just make it a four, you know, and, and hold myself accountable to it. And that was one of the things of, Hey, look, workouts can be fun. Uh, that was a hard lesson I had to learn that I don't have to go in there and just hate everything, but let's, let's make it fun. Let's do some fun stuff. Um, and, and, on the days that really, really suck, I might do my favorite things. And that that's going to be the favorite thing I want to do um, and and enjoy it and, and be good at it. And then there you go. And then the things that I hate, I'll do that tomorrow. Okay, cool. And and owe that to yourself. So I, I'm i the guy that like, hey, uh, I, I had to find a pre-workout that I liked. I had to find a protein shake that I liked so much that, hey, look, I can't have that protein shake unless I work out. <clears throat> so now I got to go do something. Um, and those little, little wins helped me get through it. Uh, especially when I didn't want to do anything. Um, and again, yeah, I could be, I could very easily be the guy that would lay on the couch all day and watch TV. And then at the end of the day, I go, God, I hate myself. So I, I did CrossFit for a year. Um, I, I hated every day of it. It was a good workout, but I hated every day of it. Uh, and I had to do the six o'clock class because I didn't know what it was. And I would get there and go, Oh, this is going to suck but I'm already here. Let's go do this. And, uh, and have my schedule allowed. I probably would have kept doing it. Um, cause it did put me in good shape, but little things like that. And I'm still that way. I still like to work out earlier in the morning, uh, and, and go. And then I know the days at least accomplish a little bit and yeah. And understand that, Hey, like not every day is going to be your best day. You know, Usain Bolt still loses races. You know, Michael Jordan didn't win every game. So, Hey, look, sucks. I didn't do good today. Uh, tomorrow is going to be a new one so screw it so yeah, yeah motivation is motivation is 
everybody talks about motivation, but it ain't really anything. Motivation is, yeah, that that might get up, but that might set your alarm clock. That doesn't mean you get up for it. Right. So uh, one of my favorite things is, hey, your alarm went off. Get up. That's it. There's no fancy to this. You know, I, I could stand over you and yell at you all day long, but it ain't going to make a difference. You got to do it. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's it. I, you know, I think that that the, the saying about, um, I mean, really, what what is to truly be a professional, right? To be a professional <laughs> in anything, uh, it's it's practicing when practice is, isn't fun. You know, you think that professional athletes want to do, you know, you, you think Michael Jordan wanted to shoot jump shots every single day. You think that, you know, <laughs> you look at guys that big, you know, big ball players, uh, you know, I mean, guys that you look up to, like for my whole childhood growing up, Derek Jeter was like the man to me. Like, oh, and, and so yes. the, whole, the, the whole debate between like Jeter and A-Rod, right? Oh, A-Rod was on. more athletically talented, but Jeter just outworked him. Jeter yeah. was a workhorse. And, and yeah. the thing about it is, you know, it's not that he was – super talented physically he just put in the work the time the study <laughs> same thing with tom brady not the most athletic dude but he's the greatest quarterback to play the game why because he studied film because he put in the reps because he put in the time to train and perform and over and over and over again and like that's really what it comes down to you know there are people that are naturally gifted sure but all the gifts in the world don't mean a, a, a nothing if if you can't get up and do the work and, and i think like that's the the beautiful thing about it is like when you get to a place where you say this workout's going to suck. Oh, well, I'm going to do it anyway. Hey, this training's going to suck. Oh, well, I'm going to do it anyway. Hey, you know, and, and almost you kind of get to the point where it's like, stop focusing on the negatives, right? Okay. Start realizing like, hey, you know, it is going to be challenging. It is going to push you, but you're going to get better because of it. And and put in the work, right? Get up and do it even when you don't want to because ultimately someone's dependent on you. You know, someone's dependent on you. Your family's dependent on you. Your kids are dependent on you. Your coworkers are dependent on you. God knows the citizens that, you know, we swore to protect. We, you know, we talk about for them, but do we really believe that? And that's, you know, practice isn't supposed to be fun. Sometimes it's fun, but it isn't always fun. And, and let's be honest, like, is it monotonous to throw ladders over and over and over again? Yes. Knowing how to do something and being good at it are two different things. Like that's just all there is to it. You know, here, here's the deal. I, I can swing a baseball bat. I could probably hit a, a few balls every once in a while if you're throwing them to me, but guess what? I'm not going to get good at it. If I, you know, those guys that are, that are home run hitters and, and hitting consistently with a, a batting average over 300, guess what they do every stinking day, man, for hours, sometimes yeah. swinging a bat over and over and over. Now, you know, people will say, well, that's just, you know, that's God given talent, but talent is only, you know, people use that excuse all the time. Like, they, well, they're just more talented or they're more athletic. Okay. That may be true to an extent, but I promise you those people, most of those people, if they just didn't put the work in, they wouldn't be playing pro ball. No, and you figured that, so a, a guy playing pro MLB baseball, he probably started playing ball at a, at a young age. So yeah. seven, eight years old. That guy is still taking batting practice before every game. Come on. How many times yeah. that guy swung a bat? You know, and, and it's so funny because there's so many things out there. People will make stuff hard. Look, working out really ain't hard. Get on the internet, Google it. Find somebody at work. Hey, how do you work out? Eating healthy isn't hard. Okay. And, Make good choices. and it's really simple. You have to burn more than you put in. Okay, cool. I mean, I don't, it's not fancy. And right. just, just go pick up heavy stuff. Run. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it really, you know, we, we make excuses sometimes like, oh, I don't have this. I don't have that. I mean, like you can do it. Listen, you don't have to have a gym to work out. Like you no. could literally, there's so many workouts that you could do right now in your basement or in your garage that require almost no extra equipment whatsoever. No, we, I mean, we bought a sandbag. Um, and even a sandbag wasn't, you know, I had a backpack that had a bunch of bricks in it at one point. Here you go. Just pick this up. You know, yeah. we, when I taught the fire Academy, we did a really good workout with your air pack where we mm -hmm. just used it. Yeah. So, and just, do a push up for Christ's sake. I mean, it's yeah. not fancy, you know, and, and it kills me how people get all wrapped up and yeah. stuff and make stuff hard. It's not, it's not somebody at your station works out, go ask that guy what to do, you know, and, uh, and to, most to fire stations now, one, you're getting paid a lot of money. So you better be right. good. Right. And two, you probably have a gym. Yeah. So what are you doing? Yeah. You, you, you could want them want to replace, we got to replace your weights because they're all overused and dear Lord. And the floor is torn up from y'all doing deadlifts. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay. Versus Good. dust on it. Come on, man. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I, I'm i a firm believer, man. If you want to know like where 
if you want to know where departments put their their priorities, look at their gym, right? Look at their the rigs, right, and the equipment, and then look at their gear. Those three things to me, if you look at those three things, I will I will tell you, I can walk into any fire department in this country and tell you where the priorities are. Yeah. Pretty quick. Oh yeah. Because, and and the thing is, like, you don't have to have a lot of money to be in shape. No. You don't have to have a, a lot of money to eat yeah. decent. You don't have to have a lot of money to, you know, to to go out and do basic fire ground skills. I mean, if you have a pumper that has ground ladders on it, can you throw a ladder? Yeah. Can you pull a hose? Sure. Do you need a lot of extra stuff to, I mean, you get some pallets and a couple boxes of screws. You could do just about anything you want to do with, with search, with, with RIT, with, you know, hose line advancement. I mean, you don't need a fancy training ground to, to do this stuff. And people, you know, sometimes like, oh, we don't have money for anything. So we don't really get to train much. I mean, like make the most out of what you do have, right? You go to, you know, buildings under construction, buildings being demolished, uh, you know, new construction, you know, dry stretches, things like that. There's so many opportunities, man, just to get out there and be a little bit better. And most of it doesn't take a long time. I can go out there for 30 minutes on a, you know, hey, this house is getting built. Let's go stretch on it. You know, we don't have to put a water in it and throw, you know, mess up their construction, yeah. but we can stretch. You know, we go on a med run. Hey, will our ladder reach that window? I don't know. Let's go find out. Take 10 minutes, go throw a ladder up there and say, oh, yeah, okay, cool. It reaches. Or, hey, no, it doesn't. We need a different plan. And that's what I think, like, what it comes down to it. You know, that's what I love about, you know, the lazy leader thing and the trainer dies. It's like, look, just put in put in the effort. A little extra effort every single shift uh, that you're there uh, goes goes so far. And just, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem like it. It's like one of those things when you're in the in the moment, you know, that 10 minutes here, 20 minutes there, 30 minutes there, an hour here, right, may not seem like much. But, again, if you do it consistently every single day that you're at work, and then some, you know, do it on the days you're not at work. And guess what? Over 10, 15 years, you're going to be a lot better than you were when you started. Yeah. We, we did a very simple, easy drill in the bay one time. Our bay's big. It's four bays, double bays. They're 75 mm-hmm. feet long. They're, they're, it's a big bay. And the pumper never moved. And we literally just picked doors that went into different rooms along the bay and said, hey, look, let's stretch to that door. Let's stretch to that door. That door room is left. That door room is right. And we're not going to move anything else. We got to go around the ladder truck. I go around. Holy crap. Oh, look. And we're in the shade the whole time. Super fun. Chill. Who could do it faster? And this, this doesn't have to be fancy. Fancy training places are great. Burn buildings are great. Sure. Uh, but if you don't have that, there's no excuse to not do it. Right. Every fire department has fire hose, for Christ's sake. I mean, just pull it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's it, man. You know, that's what I tell people all the time is like, look, you know, don't overestimate the power of just basic stuff, you know, yeah. it doesn't even workout stuff. Like you said, you don't have a fancy gym. I promise you, you can find stuff around your firehouse that you can pick up that are heavy that you can move from point A to point B. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've seen guys put in like I go out behind the station and a couple four by four posts and some five gallon buckets of cement and a, and a bar across it and make a pull up bar. I mean, it's not fancy. It's there's nothing fancy about it. It's just a couple yeah. four by four posts with a piece of metal around in the middle of it. You know, it's like, but but it doesn't. That's just it. I mean, it doesn't take a lot of money. It doesn't take a lot of you know. The, oh, the department won't buy us this or that or this power rack or whatever. Like, look, if they are willing to, fantastic. But if they're not willing to, man, like, figure out stuff. I mean, there's stuff you can do that doesn't require a time. Like, listen, if you make a pull up bar, I'm a firm believer, man. Like, if you can squat, lunge, do pull ups. In push-ups, those four things alone, and then do some cardio, do some running. Yeah. Bro, you can if you do that every shift for the rest of your career, chances are you're probably gonna be semi decent shape. If you do yeah. just do it a circuit of those every single shift. Yeah, just just pick stuff off your pumper, throw your gear on, pick a thing, walk fifty yards with it, thirty yards with it, set it down, go yeah. back and get something else. That's yeah. all you don't need anything to do that and you just move stuff. It's it's super easy. So there's really and, no excuse to this stuff. Think about what we do. I mean, most of our job is is moving heavy stuff from point A to point B. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you want to get a good workout in and call it training, you know, it's it make get, get creative sometimes. Like, hey, we're gonna go out, tra- you know, do this little training circuit. You know, you know, just have like a hose pole set up and you know, throw a ladder and you know, have a mannequin if you got one or a hose dummy or something like that, and just pull that or whack a tire with a sledgehammer. Like, next thing you know, people are doing like training, but it's a it's actually oh, PT. Yeah. It's, it's it's all it is, but you know, it's job specific. I think like, that's the thing that I've noticed is uh, a lot of guys that are on the fence about like working out because they've never had any formal like coaching or training or stuff like that. I don't know is if you get them out there just doing job specific stuff, a lot of times they forget about it 
they forget that it's PT uh, and, and they're they're doing job related stuff where they can see the benefits of each movement. You know, they can see the benefits of like, oh, hey, I'm dragging this mannequin or, hey, I'm pulling this hose. I'm throwing this ladder, or, you know, chopping wood or whatever. I mean, like, hey, this directly translates to my job. And, if, you know, if you're one of those people that struggles with like, oh, you know, I don't know all these fancy workouts of the day and all this CrossFit stuff, like, listen, don't overcomplicate it. Huh. Go do stuff that's, you know, job specific. Put your gear on and go do that stuff. I promise you, if you do 20 minutes of just getting after it, throwing ladders, pulling hose, chopping wood, pulling mannequins around and, and lifting heavy farmers carries and doing stuff like that, bear crawls or things like that, man, searching, dude, you will, you will gas yourself in no time, especially in a hundred plus degree heat. Like it doesn't take long and you're sucking down a bottle. Uh, and, and next thing you know, you're like, Hey, you got a good workout in. So, um, you know, there's really no excuse in my opinion, uh, to not have some sort of workout. I mean, something, do something, even if it's just like you said, put your gear on and go walk around, you know, walk two miles, do laps my, around the My air pack at work weighs 36 pounds. It's one of the heaviest packs Scott makes. My gear total, including the two tools that I carry, I, I weigh over 100 extra pounds. So mm -hmm. that, that stuff's not going to move itself. So no matter if, if we park 20 feet away or 1,000 feet away because the pumper had to lay hose, I still got to move that stuff that way. So yeah. it's... No. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. So uh, let me, let me kind of jump in here, man. So you, uh, you're pretty used to especially early in your career, having less staffing. Uh, you mentioned maybe like having nine guys on your, on your fires. Um, I, I can relate to that. That's kind of where I started as well. Uh, but when we're talking about short staffing, right, we're talking about limited personnel, especially, you know, delayed between your first and second do sometimes, you know, five, six, seven minutes, maybe more, depending on where you're at. Um, and having to do more with less, you, you get it. You've been there. Yeah. You, you understand that, that struggle. Um, I want to talk about some tactics and some things that folks can do to be force multipliers in that environment. Because a lot of our listeners work in, in suburban rural settings or even small urban settings right. where staffing's not great, single company houses, maybe there's a delay and, you know, especially if there's other events going on in the city, uh, even where I'm at, you know, uh, it, there may be a delay on getting a second new company there by two, three, four, five minutes, whatever, uh, just depending on what's going on. And, you know, having to do more with less is the reality for the bulk of the American Fire Service, even departments that, you know, uh, are so-called, you know, city departments. Uh, I can tell you in the bulk of the departments I've, I've been around in, in Florida, you know, even some of your bigger departments have areas that uh, the response areas are more spread out. They're more uh, suburban or rural, um, you know, and, and they may have a bunch of stations, but there's only, you know, two or three guys on a rig. Uh, and, and that's what you're getting showing up in staggered times, two, three, four, five minutes apart. So that, that's the, the reality for most of us in this job is, is we're not always blessed to have, you know, just because you have 27 people on duty doesn't mean all 27 people are going to be there when you arrive right. on scene. Right. And so having to do more with less right. is the reality. That is kind of the, the, the kind of the gist of the, of the podcast. If you I mean, really you get down to it, the make do suburban fireman podcast was born out of that conversation of like, man, you know. Uh, our urban brethren are very blessed in a lot of ways to have all these, you know, well hydrated, all these people coming, but that's just a small fraction of the fire service. And the rest of us are out here going like, Hey, I got like two dudes on my rig or I got three guys on my rig and my second dude is five minutes out or 10 minutes out. Like, what do we do? And so uh, I just want to talk about that for a minute. Some things that you have found that, uh, that work really well for you, where you're at things that kind of, you know, make, you better I, I guess if you you know if you're looking at like multitasking or picking your poison if you show up and because there's always this debate to you know to get a rescue do you go for the rescue to go do you go for fire attack do you try to split and do both um, what are some things that you've over your career have found that work really really well in that setting of you know doing more with less um, whether it's you know tactically um, I know we talked quite a bit about like booster backup in the past, um, things like that. There's little things that you can do obviously to front load your manpower. Um, but when you're, when you're a captain, you're showing up and, and, and you pull up and if you only have three guys on a rig and you know, your second dude is five minutes out, uh, that changes your, your mindset a little bit. Then if you're pulling up and you got 10 guys right behind you. Um, so what are some things that, you know, you've as a fireman and, and now as an officer that you kind of honed in on that, that you feel like really give you, a tactical edge when you pull up on the unseen, whether it's an extrication, a fire, whatever you're doing that allows you to be uh, better 
uh, as a crew, not just individually, but as a crew, if you show up with a two, two, three guys on a truck or, or are waiting for, a, um, a, you know, several minutes for another company to arrive, uh, what are the things that kind of stand out to you over 20 years that you can say, Hey, these two or three things are kind of what really helped us be more effective, uh, in that, in that time where we're waiting for more people to show up. So, so we sat down uh, several years ago and wrote down what we wanted, to, what jobs needed to get done on the fire ground, very basic, and then how we were going to accomplish those jobs with what people and then what those people were going to carry. And that, that sounds super simple, but we hadn't had that. Um, and, and the concept of we'll figure it out when we get there is complete nonsense. You know what fires you're going to make. You know, and, and walk outside, look around. Those are the buildings you're gonna make fires in. So let's let's determine that. And and for most of suburban America, you're gonna pull a cross lay, uh, you're gonna force a door, and you're gonna perform a search. And that's that's gonna be it. And if you're lucky, you can get on a roof and cut a hole. Um, if you're not, you're gonna have to do a fan. You have to figure out how to do that. So we sat down and figured that out. And just that little bit of knowing that when I, when they walk up to the door, they have those tools in hand already. There's no, we don't have to go back. We're not, we're not going back to the truck to get things. Uh, the EOs, you're not radioing for Allegan Bar or, or God bless you. You have a fire in a one story and you're looking for an attic ladder. For Christ's sake, everybody knows that you're going to need one. Um, so that little bit and, and making dudes do that and conform to that worked out really, really well. Um, all our officers carry a, a four foot hook. Um, it's a metal New York hook that's four feet long. That does two things. One, they can semi-force a door with it decently. Um, and where we're at, we don't have we don't have massive fox locks or anything crazy. Um, and they can pull ceiling with it. So that guarantees they can do two things very, very quickly with it. Um, and they can break windows with it. And it's in their hand. It's sitting next to them in the apparatus. There's no looking for it. And there's no forgetting it. So setting yourself up for success with how your gear is laid out, what's in your pockets, what tools are around you, your camera's already clipped to your pack or whatever, um, makes a big difference. And then making sure that the drivers know that they are only a driver for a minute. And when they get there, they're the, the tool guy and they're throwing stuff here and there and they're making sure the line got stretched perfect and, and they're getting everything done. And, and the least amount of time they're going to spend is standing in front of that pump panel. Um, I am a big believer, um, unless you're working the highway uh, where you need to get out of the, of the road to, on, on, on side mount pumps and side mount pump panels, because you walk by, pull a valve, and then go. There's no, no need to be standing up there. Um, and, and the top mounts, it's a bit different. Um, so those little bitty things we got to check off that we have to make sure we can do quickly, fast, uh, and effectively make a big difference. So if, if one guy can't force a door, it's going to be rough to try to get two guys up there and, and how it's set up. So we, when we ran uh, two man apparatus, it was real simple. Uh, the trucks had very big water level gauges on the side of them. Um, and the fire chief told us flat out where I worked at that time was, Hey, look, uh, the truck will pump itself. So get your ass in there. And both guys would go inside. So it was, it was pretty fun then too. Cause the first guy got off full gear. Uh, the EO would stretch the line. The guy would do a 360. Then he'd go in there and the EO start putting his gear on. And then, hey, pump's good. And then we walk in. And if you saw the, the truck started making a racket and there was a big red flashing light real high, that meant we were out of water, buddy. Uh, and no one, well, we didn't screw it up. We didn't get that one done. Um, but learning things like that and being able to to do multiple jobs without being told to, to, hey, look, uh, we're the, we were the first ones there. What that guy's gonna gonna stretch hose to the fire, and I'm gonna hump hose in as I go start searching, and being able to move quick and effectively makes a big difference because there is nobody else coming in these scenarios. Um, we do have a couple spots where we're looking at at five and ten minutes where that's till the next apparatus gets there, and so those guys got to be on their game and they're and uh, God bless them. We have one apparatus that has some old apartment complexes right by it. And those dudes, if they don't park in the right spot, it's going to be a long day. Uh, they actually have a, a two-story apartment building that's on an island behind another one. Um, it's a walkway to get to it. It's a terrible idea. Uh, and we get a lot of wind off that. So prepping for those things ahead of time and knowing that, hey, look, we need to park here. And, and, and it's just the, the three of us or the four of us till, 
10 minutes to the cavalry shows up, we got to be good. Uh, makes a big difference in, in knowing your territory. And, and I know we all want to, uh, you know, stretch hose for days and these things and tell you you're getting the reps in, but you don't, you don't get to the call faster if you don't know how to get there. So being able to operate an NBT and knowing your, your territory and, and simple things in fire station design of how long does it take a guy to get from the bed to the apparatus and, and uh, where your apparatus is parked in the bay, depending on if you have a big one like we do versus a small one makes a big difference. And, and with these, with, we're trying to knock as many seconds off as we can, because in the end, the fire truck only goes so fast. So I can't make it go any faster. So I need to, I need to sleep in my pants or, or sleep with socks on or whatever. Um, the Lieutenant in my station right now sleeps with socks on. And he flat out told me, he said, I, I can't do it. My brain does not work at the, in the middle of the night to put on these socks. Uh, and that's how he operates. So he's, he's learned that for himself. And, and I'm the guy that every bit of my gear is set up the exact same way every time. Um, because I'm the same way. I, I, my, my brain can't get it out. And every night before I go to bed, I go check the stuff to make sure it's right. Um, and I do stupid stuff like my MBTs. I, I have three different MBTs, so I have to go in and make sure they're all in night mode so that when I get in the truck, I'm not blinded and going, oh, Jesus Christ. You know, stupid crap like that. Are the doors open on the apparatus at night? You know, and these little things add up to being a make a big difference uh, when you're going to, you know, help somebody. So having your stuff laid out right, having a plan uh, and working it makes a big difference and and especially when when you know if if you're the city of houston or or fdny or wherever and that first and pumper makes the wrong turn well the second and pumper is going to be there then for us if you make the wrong turn you might have just lost five minutes crap you know and and nobody else is going to come fix that problem for you so you have to yeah. be better i feel like as as a small department um which is rough yeah, you, you got to wear a lot of hats, and and like you said, I mean, there's nowhere to hide. Uh, your your problems are amplified in in a smaller environment. Um, you know, and the thing is, like, physics are still physics. You know, fires are still fires. They still happen in in rural areas, suburban areas, just as much as they, you know, maybe not the frequency, but they they still happen. Uh, yeah. We see we see people dying in house fires in in the rural environment just as much, you know, as we see in urban, you know, maybe not in massive numbers, like I said, in, in, that you see in some of these urban systems, but, but they're still dying in, in rural departments, uh, zones. They're still, uh, having fires, uh, even in your smallest department in the country. Uh, even if you don't go to fire, like I love the Olympic fire, uh, department thing, yeah. because it's like, you know, so what you haven't been in a fire in a couple of years when a fire does happen though, how much more do you need to train so that you are ready for that moment? Because you're not getting the, the amount of fires to go, you know, trial and error, if you will, experience based, learning um but you know you're right man i mean i think the little stuff adds up the devil's in the details and you know i love how you're the nuances of just little stuff like the cad and how you set your gear up and how you set your truck up and all the little things that compound that add seconds if we can shave some of those those things on the front end if we can have writing assignments so people know exactly what they're going to do based on the type of structure that we're responding to or a call we're responding to clear-cut riding assignments and expectations, uh, setting your tools up for success, setting your gear up for success, pre-planning, knowing, hey, if we have a fire in this apartment complex, what is our you know, plan A, plan B, plan C, drilling on those things ahead of time. Uh, man, to me, like that's, that's, that's all stuff that, you know, it's easy to sit there and say it, but, you know, it's the little things that people a lot of times overlook. They overlook the little nuances that end up costing them time, you know, over, over the course of the fire. If you have, this takes an extra 10 seconds. This takes an extra 30 seconds. This takes an extra five seconds, 10 seconds, eight, you know, whatever it all adds up. And next thing you know, all those seconds are minutes. And, and we all know that time is our, is the enemy, right? Time is the problem that we're, we're really racing when we have a fire or a major call. Uh, these people don't have a lot of time. And so if we can shave time off our mask up time and how we put our gear on, I love the, the analogy of the guy wearing the socks because it's like, Hey, you know what? If that helps them get dressed in in their gear and out the door 10, 15, 20 seconds faster, then to me, like that's that's a you know, that's a win, right? It's a win yeah. if they're in the truck faster and they, they're able to take in what's going on. So uh, you know, tactically speaking, you know, it's not it's not that it's super complicated. It's just drilling the basics over and over and 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 multitasking sometimes of like, hey, you know we're going to pull this hose and go put this fire out, but we're going to search off the line on our way to the fire. Or once yeah. we put the water in the fire, we're going to search back um, and doing an engine search and, and, and just being not wasting movements, right? Not wasting energy 
uh, looking for stuff, not wasting energy, you know, fumbling around on stuff that you should already have dialed in on the front end. And I think that that's what really compounds. And and I love the mindset because to me, like that's how I grew up in the fire service, man. It was like, you know, I started out in a, in a system where it's like, you better figure it out. Cause for many years uh, it was two guys on an engine, two guys coming from another engine, five minutes away, uh, maybe yeah. mutual aid if they're not on a call and a chief. Yeah. And it's like, this is all you got. Like, you better figure it out. And so I, I love it. You know, working drivers, man, I'm so passionate oh, yeah. about that subject because to me, a working driver in a, in a low staffing scenario is absolutely a must. You can't have a driver hanging out in the pump panel in that scenario. You need drivers that are doing work, that are pulling lines, throwing ladders, getting tools where they need to go, uh, being involved tactically in the incident. And, and to me, like this, like I said, that's the force multiplier. If you got a guy in your rig, even if you got, if you got three guys on a rig, that driver working and hustling and getting stuff done is essentially becoming your outside vent guy. They become your, yeah. your, your tool man. They're your guy that's getting it or Gail that's getting all your stuff where it needs to go. Uh, and as a driver, man, I always, I love that, that role because it's like, man, you were like the glue that holds it all together. The, the lieutenant's going to ask for, Hey, it's an attic fire. They're going to need hooks. They're going to need an attic ladder. Guess where it's at mm-hmm. at the front door before they even ask mm-hmm. for it. It's already there. Hey, I know we're going to need a second line, put the line on the ground. Hey, engine so and so. I know you're going to be here in like three minutes. Give me, come in and give me your tank water, and you know, and start coordinating water supply. And what are we, what are we doing with that? And ground ladders and things like that. Hey, is there a chance they're going to the roof? I could go throw ladders, you know, to, up there by the building for them. Set us all out, or I can maybe, you know, it's a two story house. Hey, I could throw a couple ladders for egress from my guys that are going up there. Cool, no big deal. So little things like that, man. It, it's it's not complicated. It's just work. Uh, it's just taking the extra effort to anticipate the needs of the incident and getting ahead of it as much as you can and not wasting movements, uh, you know, going back and forth to the truck to find stuff that you showed up, should have already showed up to the front door with um, is it's just, it, it's monumental in the grand scheme of things of all those things add up. Yeah. Forecasting all, is a skill. So the ability to look at a fire and go, Oh, yeah. look, they're on the second floor. I need to get a ladder. Oh yeah. Yeah, no, it's, you know, we always talk about, you know, bagging the fire where's it been where's it at where it's going that's all it is is you're going hey in five minutes i'm probably going to need this okay i could probably just bring it with me so i don't keep running back and forth right so uh you know i don't know we're not the we're not the we're not exactly rocket scientists although uh your wife does work for nasa so i feel like we're like pseudo scientists because we know each other so i I don't Uh... know all her intelligence like wears off I knew. Oh, and, every time she said that, I just tell her the moon landing was fake and and <laughs> space is fake, and she, she doesn't really enjoy it too much. I think. <laughs> no, the uh, but man, yeah, absolutely, man. I love, I love the. I could talk tactics for hours and, and just the preparation stuff. And that's ninety percent what it is. It's just anticipation and preparation, man. Getting ahead of it before the incident comes in. Um, that being said, uh. It's been about 90 minutes now. Uh, we've been getting mm. after it. And you've been schooling us here on uh, on the Devin Craig-isms. Um, that being said, man, uh, we're kind of bringing us to the end of the show here. We're going to wrap it up. Uh, got a few questions for you. This is our rapid-fire segment. And uh, Devin has not been given the questions. So these are completely uh, spontaneous and organic answers. Most of them Terrible are idea. hard. But... Uh, we're gonna we're gonna do this, and and if you're crying or in the fetal position at the end of it, that's okay. I will send you a consolation prize after the episode is done. <laughs> it it'll it'll be a sticker or something along the lines of "Don't that's be a bitch," funny. but whatever. <laughs> so, all right, Devin, you ready for the rapid fire questions, man? Come on with it. All right, here we go. Question number one: What is your favorite position on the job? Ah, uh, this I, I hate to say this, but I like to drive in. Um, I love driving a ladder truck, and and still, when we teach people how to drive the new the ladder truck, I, I usually somebody slide in there because we have a tandem axle 2001 Pierce dash, it's a monster, and it only turns if you give it the gas, so it wants to go. Uh, I loved every second that I drove, um, but it sucked when you got the fire and everybody else inside, so. <laughs> yeah. Drive. Well, but- but but yeah, there's nothing wrong with that, man. I, I tell you, I, I had a blast as a driver. It's uh, truly an unsung hero position when it comes to like just logistics and making things work. And and let's be honest, it's it's fun as hell to go roaring down the road in a big ass truck and oh, yeah. getting there. You know, let, 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 most ninety percent oh, yeah. of the time, 
everybody else is jealous of you. So yeah, let's yeah, yeah let, let's uh, give the drivers a little love today. I love it. I love it. So all right, no, question number two: If you had to pick one job on the fire ground, what would it be? Uh, cutting holes. I like cutting holes. Cutting holes is fun. Uh, it makes good pictures. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, but it's it's cool. So it's it's cool to go from a perfectly fine. You know, the roof looks cool and no big deal. And then you cut a big freaking hole in it and, and fire and smoke blow out of it. And, oh, wow, look at that. Uh, so I love cutting holes. Big fan of it. So Cool. And I, I mean, yeah, I'm an engine guy, but uh, I won't take it personal. It's cool if you like to do truck stuff. You got to, you know, everybody, listen, everybody can't be real firemen. They can't all be putting, uh, putting the fire out on the inside and doing the Lord's uh, work. I, I just, you know, the engine guys need support too. So. We appreciate oh God! It. You have to have the anchor back to the truck because what would you do if you can't find the hose and your feet are my feet will get wet and I have to do math and I hate every second of it. <laughs> oh shit! Uh, all right, so moving on. So I don't I don't want to I might, might start crying here if we start talking more truck work too much more. Uh, <laughs> question number three: uh, Who has had the biggest impact on your career and or life? You can answer either one. I don't care which one. Uh, uh, but if you had to pick one person who's impacted you in a positive way uh, in life or in, in, in particular in your career, if you could think of somebody, who would it be? What's the, what's the one person that comes to mind? Uh, I'd have to honestly say three people because one would be yeah. my dad um, okay. and the example he gave us. Um, two would be David Rhodes. Uh, Chief Rhodes is one of the smartest people I know, and you wouldn't know that. Um, he's extremely he- humility. And then the last one would be my wife. Um, so my wife keeps me grounded and uh, reminds me that I'm nobody. So it's, it's good. And she takes good care of me and, and she's the unsung hero of the, of the house. Believe me, she, she takes good care of her, all of us. So those are evil. My dad, David Rhodes and my, and my wife for sure. I like it. That's a yeah, solid answer, man. Yeah. That's uh you know, no one's self-made. And you know, I no. think it's a, uh, it's no. a testament to the, the uh, many great people that influenced us along the way. So uh, yeah, man, all three of those are great answers. All right. So question number uh, four. What is the biggest challenge facing the modern fire service? I think adapting the, the old heads to the young kids and the young kids, to the old heads. So understanding that just because somebody was born after 9-11 doesn't mean they're an idiot. Um, and just because they don't know what a, a crescent rich is doesn't mean they're dumb. And just because the old guy doesn't want to carry his phone doesn't mean he's an idiot either. So getting these two people to mesh together um, and making it better uh, is definitely it um we're, we're all getting real old real quick so i mean my kids at six and, or seven and eight when they see a commercial they get mad a commercial not yeah. trying to find what something to watch just the like, show doesn't come on immediately so adapting to that uh sure is is going to be a big issue and we need to we need probably need to be friendlier about it um they're not all idiots okay so on both sides yeah no i like it that's uh that's fair man you know <laughs> Things have definitely changed. Uh, even, I mean, since I came on the job, even, and I look yeah. at the guys that have, were. I was fortunate enough to have some people that took me under their wing and helped me learn the ins and outs of stuff that you just take for granted. And, you know, and, and and I'll be honest, I wasn't the kid that, you know, I knew how to change my oil and, and change a flat tire. That was about the extent of it. But I mean, running chainsaws, stuff like that. Like, I didn't learn that until I got in the fire service. I didn't grow up doing a lot of that stuff. So, uh, kudos to the guys that could have easily written me off. There's a few that definitely would have back then but thankfully i had a few guys that were like hey you know you're all right kid come on we'll teach you the ropes and so i think that just with each generation we got to remember that right we have to remember that you know we were new ones too and didn't know shit so uh you know pay it forward uh and and get back to you know someone helped you become more you know learn the job and get where you are you are at and how much more should we do the same for the next generation like hey let's let's raise them up if we want to have a better fire service like it's on us so yeah, my wife taught my kids about breakers in our house yesterday. So, what does that tell you? And they're seven and eight. Yeah, and I got to learn it by not, but nobody telling them. So, yeah, no, absolutely, man. So, all right, question number five: uh, What's your favorite book? Oh no! Ah, oh. don't I, tell me I, it's the one. Don't tell me it's the one that's written in crayons. I know you like truck stuff, so. Uh, so I'm a Texan, so Lone Survivor is probably up there. Um, yeah. And Marcus Luttrell's brother, Morgan, is my uh, my congressman. Um, so definitely that or, God, the Frank Viscuso's book is fantastic. Uh, I'm looking around at the the 50 books I got sitting around me. And uh, Jesus, I don't know, somewhere in there probably. 
Yeah. I guess. Uh, well, you know, I read the Fourth Amendment Cup in eighty two as a kid, but you know, yeah. <laughs> everybody did, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> yes, one of those for sure. I would. Yeah. I would imagine. No, I dig, I dig it. Those, you named a couple good ones, so definitely some some solid uh, books there. Um, all right, last question. Here we go. Question number six for all the uh, all the marbles uh, for you. This is wrapping it up. This is the question that uh, hopefully uh, resonates with some of our listeners. I know we get a lot of questions, messages. Guys hit us up in the inbox and stuff. And you know, it always seems like there's there's guys that are struggling with the culture in their fire department, or struggling with you know my captain doesn't want to train, or my chief's a dick, or whatever. Um, so this question is kind of, you know, this is a, uh, a more serious question, but it, but it's a question that I think that, uh, it needs to be addressed. And I always like asking this question as much as I can, because I think that, uh, you always get little nuggets, you know, everybody's got little different angles on this, but question number six, what is the one piece of advice that you would give for firefighters struggling with a culture in their fire department? If it's not as one... terrible as you think. Okay. It's not. Every, I, and I love going to other places to find out what dumb rules somebody else has. Sure. Whether it's, you know, they can't, they can't wear their shoes inside the station or the work boots, or they can't, they can't cuss or whatever, it, whatever is, is terrible at your fire department isn't as bad as you think it is. And for God's sakes, just smile and laugh. So find the one thing that makes you smile and laugh and, and makes you happy and do that thing and understand sure. that change takes time and you might not be able to change it. So uh von oppen says very simple some, some change comes with retirement uh and sometimes maybe you don't fit there so if you look at the uh nick saban quote of of your job is to get the right people on the bus in the right seats and the wrong people off of it so dude relax it's it's the job's gotta be fun so they keep it fun if it's not fun go find something else so smile for christ's sake laugh yeah Man, I, yeah, I, I, man, I can't love that enough. Um, and uh, kind of paying respect to our brother, uh, J. Michael uh, Mueller, out there in uh, Irmo. Um, yeah. I think he said it best, right? If you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. John, uh, it's, it's, it's an awesome job. And, and I think sometimes, like you said, we get so focused on the negative crap that we forget how good we really do have it. And, and like I said, there are so many things that, we can focus on the negative or we can choose to be positive and focus on the good stuff. And, you know, I, 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 man, what, what a great answer because I think that that's exactly, that's is exactly that your perspective and your outlook and the way you approach the job um, is going to impact your, your level of stress and happiness and, yeah. and all those things. So well said, bro. Look at you. Nah. You crushed also. Uh -oh. I, you didn't even. What's up, buddy? Come here, Troy. Come sit. Hey, hi. Hey. How's it going? Are you keeping your daddy in line? Yes. <laughs> yes. Someone's got to. It's a hard job, I know. So okay. I got pink <laughs> Made it made the guest appearance. So uh hey man, dude, thank you for uh, coming on the show today. Thanks um, for having me. Thanks for sharing some passion and a little bit of you got the next one coming. There we go. Yep. Hey there. All right, say hi. Hi. <laughs> You're saying hi to all these people that are listening to the show. So, okay, come on. You guys are okay. famous now. Your dad's gonna buy you ice cream. Just uh, gotcha. come back gotcha. to the show. Gotcha. Hey. Yeah, you just met the shipping department for Trainer Die. So if you bought something from us, they're the ones that put it in there. I like it. <laughs> I, you know, now I don't have to worry about some children in in China having to be in a sweatshop. They're just in the sweatshop of the Craig household. <laughs> hey, come on, There's life skills here. They love it. <laughs> Teach him young, man. Teach him young. But yeah, man, thanks. Thanks for coming on, dude. It's been uh, a long time coming. Definitely enjoyed uh, sitting down with you and talking, talking shop as always. Um, but uh, I am about to uh, go do some, a union function here in a little bit with the wife. Uh, so uh, we're going to head out and do that here in a little bit, but uh, definitely, man, we'll get this thing edited and sent out to the masses and uh, for mass consumption. Um, and uh, here in the next, uh, well, before I go to bed tonight, it'll get done. So <laughs> One way or the other, man. But uh, thanks again, dude, for for everything. And always good to talk to you, bro. Thanks, Nick. See you on the flip side, man.